Good morning. Welcome to our service this morning on this 10th Sunday after Pentecost. It's good to be with you in this way. We hope that you are well and safe um, at home and you have been enjoying um, the summer. Uh, so we uh, welcome you today and uh, invite you to uh, participate along with us. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn number 455, Dear God, Compassionate and Kind. The kingdom of God is at hand. O oh, come, let us worship. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O oh, God, make speed to save us. O oh, Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. 
Serve the Lord with gladness and come into the divine presence with a song. Know this, the Lord, the Lord is God. The one made us and to whom we belong. We are God's people, the sheep of God's pasture. Enter the gates of the Lord with thanksgiving. Go into these courts with praise. Give thanks to God and call upon the name of the Lord. For the Lord is good, whose steadfast love is everlasting. And whose faithfulness endures from age to age. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Oh, come, let us worship. We're going to take a moment for a second. If the kids want to come a little closer, you can sit, Alexis. <laughs> I told Alexis she had to sit, stand the whole time. She doesn't have to. Hello, everyone. It's good to see you. Um, I'm just going to stand here so that we can get me all good and focused. How are you today? I hope that you're enjoying um, your summer and um, that you're staying well and healthy and having fun uh, spending time with your families. Um, so I have an experiment I want to do with you today. Um, so just let me grab my, my stuff here. Can you see this? Can you see that great big? Okay, great. Brennan says he can see it, which means you can see it. I've got a great big vase of water here. And I want to do a couple of experiments with some, some, um, some objects to see if they float or sink. So first of all, I got this block, this wooden block. What do you think? Do you think that this is going to float or do you think it's going to sink? Let's, let's check it out. What do you think? Tell me your answers. Float or sink? I think it might float only because I can feel how heavy it is. I think it's going to float. Can you see that? Does that? Perfect. It's floating. Okay, if you said float, you were right. Great. How about this? The spoon. What do you think? Do you think if I put this in here, it's going to sink or it's going to float? What do you think? Sink or float? Give me your answers. Shout them out. Let's try. Sinks. Can you see that? You probably can't see that very well. It's there down on the bottom. It sunk down to the bottom. No floating for the spoon. Okay. I'm not going to go after that. All right. How about this? This ball of tin foil. What do you think? Sink or float? It floats. Look at that. Okay. So we got a floating ball of tin foil. Okay. I can grab that. Perfect. Last but not least, friends, the cherry. What do you think? It's a hard one. I think it's gonna. I think it's gonna float. I really do. I think it's gonna float. Cause berries float, right? All berries float. I think that all berries float. Here we go. One, two. Actually, tell me what you think. I think you're gonna float or sink. One, two, three. Oh, it sunk. Look at that. I thought it was gonna. I thought it was gonna float. Hmm. So this experiment of things sinking and floating reminds me of the story that we're going to hear a little bit later on today. A story about Jesus, because, you know, all the stories that we read in the Bible and the New Testament are about Jesus. And Jesus has just spent a day um, with thousands of people, and he has fed thousands and thousands of people. Actually, he's, to be honest, to, to be very particular, he has fed 5,000 people, and he is drained. He's exhausted. And so he says to his disciples, I want you to go on ahead of me. I'll catch up. Don't worry. I'll find you. Go on ahead of me. Get in the boat. Go across the lake. I need some time to myself. So he goes up the mountain to pray for a little while, and the disciples get on their boat, and they start sailing across the sea. And as evening arrives, so do the waves and the wind. And their boat starts to rock and get bashed by the waves and the wind, and uh, they get scared because they can't seem to get a handle of the boat, and they're worried that the boat is going to fill with water, and they're going to drown. And they have to fight the waves and the wind all night. And suddenly, early the next morning, they see something in the, in the distance, and it looks like somebody on the water. Sure enough, the person gets closer and closer. They actually think it's a ghost at first, and they're quite scared. Not only are they scared of the waves and the wind, but now there's this thing coming towards them on the water, floating on the water. And as the, the, the image gets closer to them, they realize it's Jesus. And Peter says to him, he's so excited at the sight of Jesus, he said, Lord, if you want me to come, command me to come out to the water, ask me to come to you so that I may walk on the water with you. And so Jesus said, come along, come on. So Peter jumps out of the boat and he begins to walk to Jesus on the water. But the waves and the wind are still beating against him 
And he turns his face away and starts to worry about everything around him. And suddenly, he starts to sink. And he yells, help me, Lord, help me, I'm sinking. And so Jesus grabs his arm and grabs his hand, pulls him up and says, why do you have such little faith? Why are you doubting? You know that I am always here. You know that I am always here for you. I will never leave you. And so this story today teaches us how important it is to make sure that we're always keeping an eye, our eyes, our focus on Jesus. How whenever in anything that we do, we take Jesus along with us. Because sometimes, and I do it a lot too, I will turn away and focus on something else and forget that I am carrying Jesus along with me, that Jesus goes with me. And I start to feel scared and worried, maybe angry, and I can't help it. I can't help myself. And I, and I feel like I'm kind of spiraling and just getting more afraid. But as soon as I turn my face and my, my gaze back towards Jesus, and I remember that he, he walks with me and he holds my hand and he reaches out to me and grabs me when I'm in despair, or he hugs me and, and, and embraces me when I'm joyful, that I start to feel like I'm not sinking anymore. So today, our, uh, our gospel story teaches us that... Um, it is so important that we keep our gaze on Jesus, carry Jesus in our hearts wherever we go, focus on him so that we will never be like this cherry or this spoon floating to the bottom of the water, but that we can um, be assured that Jesus is always with us, holding his hand out to us to make sure we never sink. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Romans. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart, that is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Remember the marvels he has done. 
destroyed the supply of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They bruised his feet in fetters, his neck they put in an iron collar, until his prediction came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people set him free. He set him as a master over his household and to teach his elders wisdom. to the Lord and call upon his with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side. While he dismissed the crowds, and after he dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountains by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why do you doubt? When they got back into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. this morning in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Shortly after we were married, Jordan and I went on a tropical honeymoon. The resort that we were staying at had little catamaran boats that you could use if you were a registered guest. Jordan and I have never been on a sailboat, so we thought it would be a nice way to spend the afternoon. One of the employees of the resort took us out on the boat and talked us through how everything worked for about 20 minutes, and then started to take us back to shore, at which point he asked, would you like to try it out on your own? Jordan looked, looked at me slightly skeptical, 
Okay, he wasn't slightly skeptical. He was totally skeptical, scared spitless at the question. I looked out on the ocean. It looked calm enough. Sure, I said. Jordan's face turned white. But like a good newlywed husband, he went along with it. We were doing fine on our own as we sailed around in the still calm waters of the resort bay. But then we got a little cheeky and decided to venture out a bit farther where we saw some other guests that were sailing and making it look relatively easy. It was the worst decision ever. As we left the still and secure bay of the resort, the wind and the waves picked up and everything we had been taught disappeared from our memory. Within minutes, we were, uh, the wind and the waves had pushed us out in front of the resort bay next door to ours, which was not allowed by the way, and the waves and the wind from the sea were slamming our boat and us up against the reef bordering a small island offshore. I was convinced we were either gonna die or we were gonna get kicked out of the resort for breaking the rules when we were found. Suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, a boat from our resort pulled up next to us, threw us a rope, and pulled us back to shore. I was utterly embarrassed by the drama and felt like a complete idiot in all of this. But my embarrassment did not compare to the relief that overcame my being when I saw those two men and that boat and the rope that connected us together and pulled us back to safety. Some of Jesus' disciples were fishermen, and all of them lived and traveled in a region where sailing was a regular mode of transportation. They knew only too well what traveling by boat entailed, and as a result, they had a good understanding and respect for the power of the sea. So when heavy winds and waves caught them far from shore, it's easy to imagine their unease as they worked to control their boat as best they could. That unease became real fear when they saw a ghostly figure walking towards them on the water. Were they hallucinating? Is this death come to take us right now? What more could go wrong with this evening? It was none of that. It was Jesus. And as Jesus approaches the boat, he knows their fear and so identifies himself. Don't be afraid, he says, it's me. And rather than acknowledging Jesus and breathing a sigh of relief at his arrival, that relief that you experience when you're scared spitless and suddenly in the presence of someone who can help you, Peter calls out, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus does. No questions asked. When Peter steps out onto the water at first, all seems, seems fine but the winds continue to blow him off balance and he becomes afraid. Takes his eyes off Jesus just for a moment and begins to sink. He is saved only by Jesus who reaches out, pulls him to safety and in the midst, in the midst of his fear. In one of her many TED talks, Dr. Brené Brown describes that vulnerability is at the core of fear and anxiety and shame and every difficult emotion that we experience but it's also the birthplace of joy, belonging, creativity, and faith. In this moment, on the boat, the disciples are in an, in an incredibly vulnerable situation, and because of their fear, they're unable to recognize Jesus when he comes to them, when he comes to them in a way they never expected, when he comes to them in the midst of their vulnerability. And it's easy, very common too, to let our fear and our anxiety blind us from seeing the love of God all around us. It's very easy, very common to, for it to, blind, to let our fear blind us from putting our whole trust in God. However, having revealed his presence and identity, Jesus in this moment encourages the disciples and us, and us once more to leave our fear behind and live wholehearted lives. And I think that this is always God's desire for us, that we would trust that God is with us and for us, and as a result, live with courage and hope. Because the reality is God is always calling us out of our comfort zone, always calling us into something new. Our job is to hear that call. Our job is to trust that God is present and to respond to it. God calls us and encourages us to cross rough waters 
whereby we will do the things we think will be impossible. We will take chances, risk ourselves in relationship, seek the well-being of individuals and communities around us, and we will continually be called to step out of our comfort zone, all the while remembering with confidence that God is always there. Because when we step out of our comfort zone, when we face the stormy waters, something happens. Our eyes are opened to recognizing Jesus in a new way, and our relationship with him continues to deepen and transform. Will Willimon reflects on this. He says, If Peter had not ventured forth, had not obeyed the call to walk on the water, then Peter would never have had this great opportunity for recognition of Jesus and rescue by Jesus. Had Peter never had this encounter with Jesus, he would not be witness to the Peter, he would not be witness, we would not be witness to the Peter in the book of Acts, who so boldly and courageously worked to build, to build up the church of God. And it was because of this encounter and many other encounters with Jesus that Peter was the most ex- had the most extreme confidence in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in the midst of the ministry he was called to. His confidence didn't come without many moments of doubt, fear, and faint-heartedness that kept him waiting in the safety of the shallow waters in front of him, but still he answered every single call from Jesus. How many of us are simply splashing about in the safe, shallow waters of our calling? How many of us are experiencing too few opportunities to test and deepen our faith? I'd be the, I'll be the first to admit to sitting very firmly in my comfort zone throughout my vocation. But today's gospel suggests that if we want to be close to Jesus, we have to be willing to venture out of our comfort zone and into the unfamiliar sea. And by venturing forth, we prove God's promise through trusting his promises. By venturing forth, we are witnesses to the transforming grace love, and mercy of God in our lives and the world. This is the good news that we are called to share. And I won't say that it will be easy, because I know it won't be easy. Stepping out in faith is not a guarantee that we will not face troubled waters or be filled with fear. After all, we, like the disciples, have discovered so much, we've learned so much, invented so much, and yet we still have gaps that we see within our society. We still find ourselves lacking the power to do the things that really matter. We still witness families with hungry stomachs. We still witness the cries of individuals in abusive relationships, perhaps living in our very own neighborhoods. We still witness civil, religious, and world wars where peace is nowhere to be found. And we still witness pandemics and diseases with no vaccination or cure. And we often feel like in these uh, encounters, in these situations, that we're pushing against the force of the waves, alone against the elements. But N.T. Wright suggests that that's what it often feels like when you try to bring God's love and healing power into the wild night of the world. The moment when we are most strongly tempted to give up is probably the moment when help is, if only we knew it, just a step away. What is clear in this passage is that if we are to be faithful to the call of Christ, we have to have courage to step out in faith, even in the midst of scary, troubled waters. Trusting that the courageous steps we take are accompanied by the assurance that Jesus will not abandon us, that when we need it most, he will extend his arm, grab onto us, lift us up, and get us back in the boat. God is there for you, revealing God's presence, promising comfort, and calling forth courage. What we are called to do is so basic and obvious, yet so very hard to do in practice. We are called to trust that God will never abandon us. We are called to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and our ears open for his encouragement and comfort. And as we answer the many calls of God in our lives, and there will be many, I pray that our hearts and our wills may be ready to do what he says, even if it seems crazy at the time. For ours are the beautiful feet, St. Paul writes in his second reading, 
that bring the message of good news to God's beloved people. May your feet, your hearts, and your wills continue to share this most glorious news of God's unfailing love, mercy, and spirit. Amen. Let us affirm our faith now together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we dwell in God's presence, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the whole people of God, that each one may be a true and faithful servant of Christ, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those drawing near to the light of faith, that the Lord will bring them to true knowledge of himself, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our families and friends, that the Lord will give them joy and satisfaction in all that they do. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who are lonely, sick, hungry, persecuted, or ignored. We pray for those people who we know, who have asked for our prayers, and we pray for them now, either aloud or silently in our hearts. We pray that the Lord will comfort and sustain them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray for our country, for our province, and for our city that the Lord will help us to contribute to its true growth and well-being. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray today for the whole human family, that we may live together in justice and peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray, too, for the forgiveness of our sins, that we may obtain this forgiveness by God's infinite goodness and mercy. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, you sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of your church. Open our hearts to the riches of your grace, that we may bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in love, joy, and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now gathering our prayers and praises into one, let us pray as our Savior Christ has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds and the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and those you love this day and always. Amen. Amen. Before we close, I just want to share a few announcements with you. Um, first of all, a uh, sincere and uh, very heartfelt thank you to Alexis for joining us today and singing, and for Karen for playing. Um, it kind of feels like a little bit more normal today because there are, you know, it just feels we're, people are kind of back in the saddle. It's lovely. So thank you both for being here. It's been lovely to, um, to worship with you this morning. Um, we continue to meet on Tuesdays and Wednesdays for our Summer in the Garden gatherings. So every Tuesday and Wednesday morning from 9.30 to 11, the church is open um, for quiet prayer. Uh, we have um, uh, individual reflections um, based on the, on the parables that you're welcome to uh, read through, or you can just come into the church um, simply for quiet prayer on your own. Uh, this time is also clergy hours, so from 9.30 to 11, if you would like to come and talk to um, clergy, uh, that would be the time to come. I mean, we're available anytime, but if you want to catch us, that would be a great time for you to, um, to, to come. Uh, so please, if you uh, need to chat um, or you would like prayer, uh, please do join us Tuesday and Wednesday mornings between 9.30 and 11. Also on Wednesdays, we continue our Summer in the Garden gatherings in the evenings, and they start at 6 o'clock with Messy Summer. For, so kids, bring your parents, um, and each evening on Wednesday, we look at a parable through different using different activities um, that are socially distanced, and uh, um, we spend some time together uh, worshiping that way. After Messy Summer, at about 7 o'clock, uh, we'll be uh, enjoying another concert, one of our weekly concerts. Uh, so if you would like to come, bring a lawn chair or a blanket. If you don't have either of those, we will find you a chair. Uh, but do uh, join us at 7 o'clock for a concert, a free concert on the lawn, followed by a very short Vesper service to end our evening and to prepare us for a quiet night. Um, may you and your families continue to be blessed in this time. I pray uh, that you remain in good health, safe health, and uh, that you have uh, good and fruitful time with your family this summer. Our closing hymn is hymn number 458, Seek Ye First. Shall be added unto you. Hallelujah.
And as we answer the many calls that God has in our lives, sorry, and can I just go back to that, and as we have, as we answer the many calls, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 